Hello, and welcome to the channel. Please like and subscribe to help support the channel. Today's topic is adrenal insufficiency. Adrenal insufficiency can be classified into primary, secondary, and tertiary insufficiency. Addison's disease, primary adrenal insufficiency, is caused by destruction of the adrenal cortex. This causes reduced production of glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, mineralocorticoids, such as aldosterone, and adrenal androgens, such as dehydroepiandrosterone. The absence of cortisol leads to increased production of adrenocorticotrophic hormone, ACTH, because negative feedback to the pituitary gland is reduced. In Addison's disease, ACTH is elevated and there is hyperpigmentation. Addison's disease may occur in isolation, but is associated with other autoimmune conditions in 50 to 80% of cases. Conditions associated with Addison's disease include autoimmune thyroid disease, pernicious anemia, vitiligo, and type 1 diabetes mellitus. Of people with autoimmune Addison's disease, about two-thirds have an autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome. Autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome type 1, up to 15% of people with Addison's disease, usually autosomal recessive, typically presents in childhood. Triad of Addison's disease, hypoparathyroidism, and chronic candidiasis may also be associated with type 1 diabetes mellitus, hypogonadism, premature ovarian insufficiency, pernicious anemia, autoimmune thyroid disease, chronic active hepatitis, immunoglobulin A deficiency, chronic atopic dermatitis, keratoconjunctivitis, vitiligo, and alopecia. Autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome type 2, more common. Complex genetic trait with links to human leukocyte antigen, HLA, major histocompatibility complex. Usually involves Addison's disease and autoimmune thyroid disease or type 1 diabetes mellitus. May also include premature ovarian insufficiency, vitiligo, pernicious anemia, celiac disease, and hypoparathyroidism. Secondary and tertiary insufficiency. Adrenal insufficiency may also be caused by long-term administration of corticosteroids or disorders of the hypothalamus or pituitary gland, but this is not Addison's disease. Secondary adrenal insufficiency occurs when pituitary ACTH production is insufficient. This leads to reduced cortisol production and adrenal atrophy. Causes include intracranial disorders, such as pituitary tumors, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and traumatic brain injury. Tertiary adrenal insufficiency occurs when hypothalamic production of corticotropin-releasing hormone is disrupted and production of ACTH from the anterior pituitary is insufficient. Causes include long-term administration of corticosteroids and less commonly tumors, radiotherapy, or surgery affecting the hypothalamus. CRH and ACTH is low in secondary and tertiary insufficiency. The normal function of angiotensin II and aldosterone is sodium absorption and potassium excretion via the kidneys. When aldosterone is not released from the adrenal gland due to destruction of adrenal gland, it results in hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. You can pause the video to look at the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Causes of primary adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease, include autoimmunity. In Western countries, Addison's disease is most commonly caused by autoimmunity, accounting for around 90% of cases. Of these, in approximately 40% of cases, the adrenal gland is affected in isolation. In approximately 60% of cases, Addison's disease occurs as part of a multi-organ autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, the most common cause of primary adrenal insufficiency in children, and other genetic causes such as adrenoleukodystrophy. Infections such as tuberculosis, meningococcus, haemophilus influenza, cryptococcosis, cytomegalovirus, and HIV. Tuberculosis is a significant cause of primary adrenal insufficiency in countries where infection is endemic. Adrenal metastases, amyloidosis, Hemochromatosis, iatrogenic causes such as bilateral adrenalectomy, adrenal hemorrhage, for example from anticoagulant treatment, 
and use of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies in the treatment of cancer. Complications The most serious complication of Addison's disease is adrenal crisis. This occurs when a person with Addison's disease experiences severe physical stress. The adrenal glands cannot supply the extra cortisol needed to cope with the stress, and life-threatening symptoms develop. Even if the person is young and otherwise fit, adrenal crisis may result in severe dehydration, hypotension, hypovolemic shock, altered consciousness, seizures, stroke, or cardiac arrest. Children with adrenal crisis are more susceptible to hypoglycemia that if not promptly recognized and treated can result in death or permanent brain damage. The most common causes of adrenal crisis in people with diagnosed Addison's disease are gastrointestinal illness, 23%, other infections, 25%, perioperatively, 10%, physiological stress slash pain, 9%. Other complications include reduced quality of life. Factors affecting quality of life include fatigue, loss of energy, depression, anxiety, reduced ability to cope with daily activities, and loss of libido, particularly in women. Adverse maternal and neonatal outcomes. Poorly managed Addison's disease in pregnancy has been associated with increased risk of maternal mortality, miscarriage, preterm delivery, impaired fetal growth, and congenital abnormalities. Premature ovarian insufficiency. Approximately 10 to 20% of women with autoimmune Addison's disease develop POI before 40 years of age. The risk of developing POI is particularly high in women with autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome type 1, up to 50 to 70% in some studies. Prognosis. If untreated, Addison's disease is always fatal. Lifelong replacement therapy is essential. Some studies have shown that even with treatment, people with Addison's disease are at increased risk of premature death. Adrenal crisis is a significant cause of mortality, particularly in people under the age of 40 years. Excess glucocorticoid replacement has also been associated with increased mortality. Clinical features. Diagnosis of Addison's disease is often delayed because symptoms are nonspecific, common, and overlap with many other conditions. More than half of people with Addison's disease have symptoms and signs for more than one year before diagnosis. A person with Addison's disease may present with a sudden crisis precipitated by intercurrent infection or stress. Features may include hypotension, hypovolemic shock, delirium, reduced consciousness, acute abdominal pain, vomiting, headache, low-grade fever, and muscle weakness. Hypoglycemia can also occur, in particular in children. Also consider Addison's disease in a person with persistent, nonspecific clinical features, such as fatigue. This affects most people with Addison's disease. Hyperpigmentation, due to increased pituitary adrenocorticotrophic hormone. This affects about 80% of people with Addison's disease, particularly in sun-exposed areas, recent scars, pressure points, areas of friction, such as the waistline, palmar creases, and mucous membranes. Gastrointestinal symptoms, for example, weight loss, loss of appetite and premature satiety, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, and or cravings for salt. Musculoskeletal symptoms, for example, muscle weakness, difficulty getting up from sitting or carrying weights, muscle cramps due to electrolyte derangement, and joint pain. Cardiovascular symptoms including postural dizziness due to hypotension, blood pressure decrease of 20 millimeters of mercury between sitting and standing measurements. Other symptoms including headache, low-grade fever, increased thirst or urination, loss of axillary or pubic hair in women, and anxiety or depression. Hypothyroidism where symptoms worsen when levothyroxine is started. Elevated thyroid stimulating hormone in isolation may indicate hypoadrenalism. Type 1 diabetes mellitus and recurrent unexplained hypoglycemic episodes. Other autoimmune diseases, such as vitiligo, pernicious anemia, chronic active hepatitis, alopecia, and celiac disease. Hyponatremia and hyperkalemia on blood biochemistry, 
Hyponatremia is present in around 70 to 80% and hyperkalemia in 30 to 40% of people with Addison's disease. In children, presenting features may also include prolonged neonatal jaundice, failure to thrive, or delayed puberty. Investigations If there is clinical suspicion of impending adrenal crisis emergency treatment, should never be delayed to carry out investigations. Untreated adrenal crisis can be rapidly fatal. In adults, if adrenal insufficiency is suspected on the basis of clinical features and urgent treatment not indicated, consider investigations such as urea and electrolytes. Sodium levels may be low and potassium levels high in Addison's disease but normal serum sodium and potassium levels do not exclude the diagnosis. Blood glucose. Blood glucose may be borderline or low. Other blood tests including calcium, full blood count, liver and thyroid function tests that may reveal mild or moderate hypercalcemia, anemia, mild eosinophilia, and or lymphocytosis, increased liver transaminases, raised thyroid stimulating hormone, serum cortisol level, the serum cortisol level should ideally be obtained at 8 to 9 a.m. Random serum cortisol levels have a low sensitivity for Addison's disease because there is a diurnal variation in cortisol levels, highest in the early morning and lowest late in the evening. Seek specialist advice from an endocrinologist before obtaining a serum cortisol level in. People who work shifts, it is uncertain when the best time to obtain a serum cortisol level is, and interpretation of the results can be difficult. An adrenocorticotrophic hormone stimulation, synacthin, test may be required. People receiving long-term corticosteroid treatment, interpretation of results can be difficult, and an adrenocorticotrophic hormone stimulation, synacthin, test may be required. People receiving estrogen treatment, such as oral contraception or hormone replacement therapy, interpretation of the results can be difficult as estrogens increase hepatic production of cortisol-binding globulin and therefore increase cortisol levels. Pregnancy. If adrenal insufficiency is suspected in pregnancy, seek urgent specialist advice. Interpretation of investigations is difficult and untreated adrenal insufficiency in pregnant women is associated with serious complications including increased mortality. When interpreting cortisol results, be aware that laboratories use many different assays. Check local reference ranges. As a general guide, if the serum cortisol level is less than 100 nanomol slash L, admit the person to hospital, adrenal insufficiency is highly likely. Between 100 and 500 nanomol slash L, refer the person to endocrinology for further investigations, including an adrenocorticotrophic hormone stimulation, synacthin, test. The urgency of referral depends on the severity of symptoms and the serum cortisol level. Postural hypotension and or electrolyte disturbance are indications for urgent referral or admission. Addison's disease is less likely if the cortisol is greater than 400 mole slash L, but cannot be excluded if the person is acutely unwell at the time. In children, if adrenal insufficiency is suspected, urgently arrange for investigations to be carried out in secondary care. Emergency admission to hospital may be required depending on the clinical picture, use clinical judgment, Untreated adrenal crisis can be rapidly fatal. Children with adrenal insufficiency are particularly at risk of hypoglycemia that requires prompt treatment to avoid long-term neurological deficits. The diagnosis of Addison's disease is confirmed in secondary care, where emergency admission is not indicated. For adults, refer the person to a specialist endocrinology unit. For children, urgently refer to a pediatrician preferably one with an interest in endocrinology. Investigations in secondary care include an adrenocorticotrophic hormone stimulation, synacthin, test, to confirm the diagnosis, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, ACTH, levels, serum ACTH levels are high in Addison's disease, primary adrenal insufficiency, but are low in secondary adrenal insufficiency, plasmarenin and aldosterone levels, Renin levels are typically high and aldosterone levels low in Addison's disease. In secondary adrenal insufficiency, the renin-angiotensin system can function normally. Serum DHEAS, typically low in Addison's disease. Thyroid function tests. Autoantibody levels, 
adrenal cortex autoantibodies or antibodies against 21 hydroxylase are present in more than 80% of people with recent onset autoimmune adrenalitis. Computed tomography, CT, or magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, is not usually required if autoimmune adrenalitis is likely, but may be requested if tuberculosis or other infection, hemorrhage, infiltration, or neoplastic disease is suspected. Adrenocorticotrophic Hormone Stimulation, Synacthin, Test For the adrenocorticotrophic hormone, ACTH, stimulation, synacthin, test, in secondary care. Blood samples are obtained to check serum cortisol levels before and 30 minutes after administering 250 micrograms of tetracosactide, a synthetic analog of ACTH, intravenously or intramuscularly. This test can be performed at any time of day, as the post-stimulation value is used for diagnostic purposes. A normal response to the ACTH stimulation test is an increase in the serum cortisol level. In people with normal adrenal reserve, cortisol levels increase to more than 500 to 550 nanomol slash L after 30 or 60 minutes. In people with adrenal insufficiency, serum cortisol levels do not increase adequately in response to tetracosactide because the adrenal cortex is already receiving maximum stimulation from endogenous ACTH. Differential diagnosis. Symptoms of Addison's disease may mimic acute abdomen, severe dehydration, circulatory shock, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain associated with adrenal crisis can be mistaken for an acute abdominal emergency. Gastroenteritis. Nausea and vomiting are key features of adrenal insufficiency and crisis. Depression. Chronic fatigue, malaise, and anorexia may mimic depression. It is not uncommon for the symptoms of Addison's disease to be wrongly diagnosed as mental health problems. Adrenal crisis can be precipitated in unrecognized Addison's disease by antidepressant drug treatment, as some antidepressants are sodium depleting. Eating disorders, weight loss, nausea, vomiting, and vague abdominal pain may be confused with symptoms of an eating disorder. Type 1 diabetes mellitus. Fatigue, unexplained weight loss, and thirst may occur in either condition. However, blood glucose is usually normal or low in adrenal failure. Chronic fatigue syndrome. Fatigue is a predominant feature in many people with Addison's disease. Hyperemesis and cloasma of pregnancy. Symptoms of Addison's disease may be attributed to vomiting and pigment changes associated with pregnancy. Treatment Treatment regimens for Addison's disease are initiated and adjusted by a specialist endocrinologist. Repeat prescriptions may be provided in primary care under a shared care arrangement. Both glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid replacement are needed. Androgen replacement is not routinely prescribed in the UK. Glucocorticoid replacement, hydrocortisone is usually used but in specific circumstances, alternative forms of glucocorticoid, for example, prednisolone, may be prescribed by endocrinology. For adults, the daily dosage of hydrocortisone is usually 15 to 25 milligrams in divided doses. Dosage depends on body weight, metabolism, and absorption. Ideally, glucocorticoid replacement should resemble the natural cycle of corticosteroid release. Three divided doses are usually given, for example, 10 milligrams on waking, 5 mg at noon, and 5 mg in the early evening, as this aims to provide even levels of glucocorticoid throughout the day. Two divided doses are also an option, for example 15 mg in the morning and 10 mg in the afternoon or early evening, but this may lead to more variation in cortisol levels. For people doing shift work, doses of glucocorticoid should follow the person's daily routine, not the time on the clock. For example, the first dose should be given on getting up after sleep, even if this is not in the morning. For children, daily dosage is usually around 8 to 10 mg slash m2 body surface area in 3 to 4 divided doses. Mineralocorticoid replacement, 
Fludrocortisone is usually used to replace aldosterone. For adults, the daily adult dosage of fludrocortisone is usually 50 to 200 micrograms. Dosage depends on metabolism and exercise levels and varies across the person's lifespan. Children have a much higher mineralocorticoid requirement. Dosage depends on the age and weight of the child and the severity of the condition, and they may need salt supplementation. At high temperatures and humidity, the fludrocortisone dose may need to be increased to compensate for the increased salt loss from sweating. Androgen replacement, dehydroep androsterone, DHEA, is an androgen made in the adrenal cortex. Therefore, levels are decreased in Addison's disease. DHEA replacement, unlicensed, may be prescribed in certain circumstances, such as persistent fatigue by endocrinology. Advice to patients. Ensure that the person with Addison's disease and their family or carers, if appropriate, are aware of. The need for lifelong glucocorticoid replacement treatment and the potentially life-threatening complications that may arise with inadequate replacement, especially at times of illness, surgery, and physical stress. How to adjust their replacement steroid medication during periods of illness, including fever, injury, or strenuous exercise. People with Addison's disease taking systemic steroids equivalent to 20 mg of prednisolone or more per day, any age, and children under 20 kg taking a dose of 1 mg or more per kg per day should be offered seasonal influenza and pneumococcal vaccination. How to recognize the symptoms of an adrenal crisis and how to give intramuscular hydrocortisone in an emergency. A family member slash carer should also know how to do this. The endocrine team should teach patient and relatives slash carers how to self-administer intramuscular hydrocortisone. The need to make the team responsible for their care aware that they may need extra glucocorticoid replacement if they are undergoing a procedure such as surgery, dental treatment, or endoscopy. The emergency telephone numbers for their specialist endocrine team. The importance of carrying emergency information on their person. For example, medical alert identification. This allows healthcare professionals to access a 24-hour helpline for more information on a person's condition in an emergency if they are not able to give information themselves. NHS Steroid Emergency Card This alerts healthcare professionals that the person is on steroid treatment that should not be stopped suddenly and includes a summary for emergency treatment of adrenal crisis. The British Society for Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes have produced a pediatric steroid treatment card for children with adrenal insufficiency. This contains details of emergency treatment. Emergency Crisis Letter The Addison's Disease Self-Help Group website provides a letter for healthcare professionals that people with Addison's disease can carry with them in case of medical emergency. This is available in a variety of languages for people traveling abroad. Advise the person. They are entitled to receive their medication free of charge. It is important to renew prescriptions in good time to avoid running out of medication. That when traveling, they should take extra medication plus an emergency hydrocortisone injection kit. It may be necessary to supply a doctor's note for airport security explaining the need for medication, needles, and syringes in hand luggage. On registering with their local ambulance trust. In many areas of the UK, people with Addison's disease can register with their local ambulance trust. Written confirmation from the person's GP is usually required. To ensure 999 callouts are allocated high priority, and a vehicle carrying injectable hydrocortisone. On sources of patient information, the Addison's Disease Self-Help Group provides a manual for people with Addison's disease, covering issues including medication, diet, exercise, pregnancy, looking after children with Addison's disease, traveling, and managing adrenal crisis. This is available on their website, www.addisons.org.uk. Ensure that if the person is undergoing surgery, endoscopy, or dental treatment, the team responsible for their care are aware that extra glucocorticoid replacement may be required. Glucocorticoid cover for major surgery will be managed by the hospital. Four primary care procedures, the Addison's Clinical Advisory Panel advise four. Minor surgical procedures, for example, skin lesion excision with local anesthetic. An extra oral dose 60 minutes ahead of the procedure and an extra dose 60 minutes after the procedure then return to normal dose. Dental surgery without general anesthetic, for example, root canal work with local anesthetic. Double oral glucocorticoid dose, up to 20 mg hydrocortisone, 
one hour before surgery. After the procedure, double the dose of oral medication for 24 hours, then return to the normal dose. Minor dental procedures, for example replacement filling, scale and polish. An extra oral dose, 60 minutes ahead of the procedure, and an extra dose where hypoadrenal symptoms occur afterwards. Then return to normal dose. Follow-up. Follow-up will usually be shared between primary and secondary care. Ensure that the following areas have been covered. Asking about any symptoms and general well-being. Reinforcing self-care advice, including how to increase corticosteroid cover for illness, injury, or strenuous exercise, use of a medical alert bracelet, and the need to carry spare medication at all times. Provision of hydrocortisone for injection with needles and syringes to treat adrenal crisis. Check that the person and their family slash carers are competent to administer an intramuscular injection of hydrocortisone in an emergency. Patient information with clear instructions and pictures of how to self-inject is available on the Addison's Disease Self-Help Group website. Screening for other endocrine or autoimmune disorders, such as pernicious anemia, type 1 diabetes mellitus, and thyroid dysfunction. Reproductive health. Ask about menstrual cycle in women of childbearing age to check for premature ovarian insufficiency. Pregnancies occur in about 20% of females with diagnosed Addison's disease. Close monitoring from endocrinology and obstetric teams is required throughout pregnancy. For monitoring of medication, treatment dose changes are made under specialist supervision on the basis of clinical response. There are no objective measures for assessing the effectiveness of treatment. When reviewing a person with Addison's disease in primary care, look for clinical features of overreplacement, such as hypertension, thin skin, striae, easy bruising, impaired glucose regulation or hyperglycemia, and electrolyte abnormalities. Underreplacement, ongoing symptoms of Addison's disease, including fatigue, postural hypotension, nausea, weight loss, hyperpigmentation, and salt craving. If over or underreplacement is suspected, Seek specialist advice from an endocrinologist with urgency depending on clinical judgment. Around 10% of people treated for Addison's disease have essential hypertension. The person should be assessed by endocrinology to ensure that glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid replacement is not excessive. If essential hypertension is confirmed, treatment with ACE inhibitors or calcium blockers is preferred. Diuretics should be avoided. Adrenal crisis management. If an adrenal crisis is suspected, arrange emergency admission to hospital. Do not delay admission by doing diagnostic tests. Give the person hydrocortisone intramuscularly or intravenously, if not already self-administered, and stabilize with an intravenous saline infusion, if available, before transfer to hospital. Transfer in a sedan or a carry chair should be avoided as this increases the risk of circulatory complications. The preferred formulations of hydrocortisone are hydrocortisone sodium phosphate, if cortisol, this is licensed for the treatment of adrenal crisis and may be more suitable for self-injection kits because it is a solution and does not require reconstitution. However, there is a risk of pain and paresthesia on intravenous injection and it is not recommended for use in children. Hydrocortisone sodium succinate, solocortef, this is licensed for treating adrenal crisis but it is in powder form requiring reconstitution and so may be less suitable. Do not use hydrocortisone acetate injection to treat an adrenal crisis. The dose of hydrocortisone depends on the person's age. For adults, 100 mg. For children, the pediatric endocrinology team should provide an emergency management plan including the hydrocortisone and fluid regimens. Dose will vary with age and body surface area. As a guide, children over 6 years of age, 100 mg. Children 1 to 5 years of age, 50 mg. Infants up to 1 year of age, 25 mg. Emergency administration of fludrocortisone is not required because high-dose hydrocortisone has a mineralocorticoid effect. 
It is important for people with Addison's disease to be aware of circumstances when they should increase their corticosteroid, such as during a period of illness or strenuous exercise, to reduce the risk of adrenal crisis. For children, seek advice from their specialist. For adults, it is difficult to accurately predict the needs of each person, but as a guide. For intercurrent illness or injury, if the person has a moderate intercurrent illness, such as illness with fever, more than 37.5 degrees Celsius, illness requiring bed rest, or illness requiring antibiotics, they should double their usual dose of hydrocortisone until recovered. Severe nausea often occurs with headache. They should take 20 mg hydrocortisone orally and sip oral rehydration solution, such as Dioralite. Severe intercurrent illness, such as vomiting, persistent diarrhea, or other severe illness, they should use their emergency injection, 100 mg hydrocortisone, and seek immediate medical advice, emphasizing that it is an Addison's disease emergency. COVID-19 infection, seek urgent specialist advice. A low threshold for applying sick day rules and considering emergency treatment is needed. Had an injury, they should take 20 mg hydrocortisone orally immediately to avoid shock. Serious trauma will require administration of their emergency injection, 100 mg hydrocortisone, and admission. For surgical, invasive medical, or dental procedures, ensure the anesthetist and surgical team, dentist, or endoscopist are aware of the need for extra oral medication. For exercise, for strenuous exercise, such as a marathon, the person will need to increase their medication, up to double the normal dose of glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid, as well as sufficient fluids. For gentle short-duration exercise, such as walking, the person does not generally need to make a dose adjustment. For sports or activities with a risk of injury, such as skiing, the person should ensure that a teammate is trained in administration of emergency hydrocortisone if needed. If unsure whether a dose adjustment is needed, seek specialist advice. For fasting, for people wishing to fast, a thorough risk assessment, ideally several months before Ramadan, should take place with their endocrinology team. Depending on level of risk, religiously compatible alternatives to fasting or medication changes may be discussed. Prior to fasting, ensure the person understands the sick day rules, including when to terminate or abstain from fasting, and ensure the person has a valid intramuscular hydrocortisone pack and knows how to administer this. For people taking an alternative glucocorticoid to hydrocortisone, such as prednisolone, consult their care plan slash seek advice from an endocrinologist regarding appropriate dose increases.